I uh, want to welcome all of you to our uh, brief session discussing uh, best practices around ITIL metrics and key performance indicators. Uh, let me start off uh, by giving a brief uh, introduction on our subject, and uh, Randy and I will go back and forth uh, discussing the subject at some depth. Uh, and I would encourage you to please uh, type in your questions uh, as you think about them throughout our session, and I'll, uh, we'll do our best to get uh, as many of them answered as we can before our session ends. Uh, as well as uh, we will respond with an email afterwards uh, with links to the presentation material, uh, as well as uh, answers to the questions that we have received. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, start our uh, presentation and discussion. So our agenda today will be looking at uh, performance improvement and what is uh, the general uh, companies and the uh, industry doing with respect to process improvement and performance improvement overall. We'll talk about ITIL very briefly uh, and its role in the industry and its adoption and uptake. And we will then uh, get into our detailed discussion around IT performance metrics. And Randy will walk us through uh, some of the experience that he has as well as what he's observed uh, in a number of client situations uh, so that we can kind of set a context for what is going on in the industry. And we will uh, move into discussing challenges and ways to overcome them as well as discuss uh, how to think about performance measurements as well as KPIs with respect to ITIL and improvement initiatives. Uh, we will end our discussion with a short demonstration of a product offering that actually helps with the activities that we'll talk about today. Uh, what we hope to leave you with today uh, is, number one, why metrics are such a critical building block for having an ITIL uh, initiative that is successful. Uh, why it's important to start started at the beginning of the journey. We find that uh, Many times organizations have started the journey with the best intentions, but don't always have ways to show their success a year or two years down the road. Uh, we'll talk about common challenges uh, that are associated with having a metrics program. Uh, we'll talk about ways to deal with performance management programs within the company and what are the key elements to think about. Uh, we'll talk about how to define and focus on the key metrics that matter the most and then leave you with some ideas about tools and technology enablers. So with that in mind, I'm going to move us to slide five. Uh, and this is, uh, in essence, a quick view of uh, what we refer to as public domain best practice frameworks that are being used by a number of our clients uh, on a global basis. Uh, of course, uh, you've all seen a significant uptake in the U.S. Uh, for the ITIL uh, framework. Uh, and I'll talk about the background just very briefly. But in essence, uh, if there is any improvement activities going on within the uh, IT operations area, ITIL framework seems to be the dominant uh, framework that both vendors and users uh, have uh, kind of converged on in general. And there's a corresponding organizational certification that we'll uh, briefly talk about, and that's ISO 20000. Uh, with respect to CMMI or software development activities, uh, we find that the Carnegie Mellon University framework referred to as capability maturity model integrated is the most popular with respect to improving software development. Of course, PMBOK uh, from the PMI Institute, the uh, Project Management Body of Knowledge. And finally, COBIT from ISECA, which has to do with governance and uh, having appropriate controls within the environment. And at the bottom of the screen, you will notice how we have positioned uh, these frameworks, uh, whether they're process execution oriented, control oriented, or strategic in their views. And of course, work instructions are always developed by the client for their specific environment. Uh, we find public domain frameworks like these have a significant appeal uh, due to the easy entry and, and the fact that there's been a significant number of thought leaders who have contributed to them. Uh, just a brief uh, historical perspective. Uh, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with this, uh, but I'll spend a minute on uh, talking about ITIL's background. Uh, this effort started uh, with the uh, United Kingdom's uh, CCTA, uh, now what's called uh, Office of Government Commerce in the 80s. Uh, it had contributions from thought leaders within governments initially, uh, as well as vendors. Then it got expanded to include commercial as well as broad global community of practitioners. Uh, this basically became uh, the version one in late 80s. Eventually, was consolidated into a series of seven books in 2000 under uh, the nomenclature ITIL version two, and we finally saw the latest release, version three, come into the market uh, in the last uh, uh, year or so, back in May of 2007 and that is made up of five books that we'll talk about very briefly. Uh, the key uh, contributions I believe that ITIL will bring to many organizations is the idea of uh, focusing what we do around customer, uh, customer meaning customer centricity, 
uh, bringing a process orientation to the organization, uh, developing a common language, and in essence, uh, looking at activities that have been agreed upon by many practitioners and thought leaders to be the good practices or best practices to perform some of these core activities within IT. Uh, version 3, very briefly, uh, it moved us towards the concept of service lifecycle management. Uh, if you're familiar with version 2, we had 10 process areas plus one function. Version 3 basically took both, both of those uh, domains of service delivery and service support, uh, brought them into a service lifecycle perspective, and that is really the biggest change that we, we saw between the V2 and V3, along with a series of key concepts about how we work with business, and it made the idea of managing services uh, from inception to retirement a mandatory part of the framework, and also, of course, best practice guidelines. Uh, it did also take into account all of the other frameworks that have been developed over the last several years so that it's a comprehensive view of how it interacts with other parts of the organization and not just focused on IT operations. Uh, the slide 9 gives us a quick view of the service lifecycle and how the processes uh, map into those lifecycle activities. So specifically, at the bottom of the page, a service strategy, uh, is a book dedicated to the idea of what offerings and what service capabilities we should have within the IT organization given the clients that we serve, the idea of developing service portfolio, the idea of understanding and managing uh, customer demand, and of course the financial management concepts that uh, was uh, covered in the version 2 environment. Uh, from there, uh, on the left side, there's the concept of service design. This is all the activities that we found under what was called service delivery domain. Uh, the idea of basically intentionally designing a particular IT service or business service to perform to a certain level of expectations in terms of availability, capacity, security, uptime, and architectural constraints. A uh, very important part of the, uh, the framework, and of course the concept of supplier management is now explicitly uh, discussed and addressed within the service design area. Service transition is the typical activities we saw under release, change, and configuration management under version 2 dealing with a more formal definition of how we move services from uh, inception of designing them into the transitionary process of understanding and planning for transition and then eventually moving into production. Service operations uh, has been expanded so that incident management has been broken down to four other key sub-elements or sub-processes as well as additional functions that have been introduced besides the service desk and we now have a dedicated uh, book, if you will, to the concept of continual service improvement. So there's a specific guidance beyond, beyond what we saw in version 2 where it talked about specifically what KPIs to think about for a particular process, but more holistically how to think about service improvement and how it impacts the customer and how to go about implementing such a program. Uh, page 10 discusses the importance of a process-oriented thinking that uh, ISO brings to the organization. Uh, Process thinking allows us to start measuring, which is a very important part of what ITIL brings to an organization. Uh, process orientation allows us to focus on an objective and a goal that is pertinent and critical to the success of the client, and then from there design activities that produce that outcome. We can then start to look at what's referred to as KPIs, or key performance indicators, both from activities as well as the process output to ensure that we're getting the kind of results that we want. And fundamentally, metrics are key to being able to do this for an organization. Uh, this is a quick view on page 11 of ISO 20000. Uh, this is a corollary standard that's been uh, developed uh, for organizations who are interested in receiving third-party certification on actually uh, adopting and practicing their best practices based on ITIL. Uh, it is very similar to the framework that we see in ITIL. However, uh, because of timing issues, there are some minor differences that are not being reconciled uh, from version 3 to the ISO 20000. Uh, so version uh, 2 had the core processes uh, embedded in it. ISO 20000 included the idea of having a management system uh, and specifically uh, dealing with services from a lifecycle point of view and specifically ensuring integration amongst processes. Uh, organizations can become certified uh, in ISO 20000. In the U.S., we have now three organizations that are certified, uh, and there are a number of companies who are working uh, on that front now. 